her attorney. So attorney April Prayer, unmute your mic, my sister. How you doing today? All right. How do I sound? Are you doing well? Oh, yeah. We're doing great. You are great. Coming through loud All and clear. Right. All right. Well, so hello, what Miss you Xavier. Doing uh, how you doing? <laughs> I'm I'm stressed. Stress is a lot going on in the world. We got a lot to talk about. So I'm stressed. We got to get to it. Listen, I got the first question for you. And I want to know how that boy got off. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was number one on my list of things to talk about today. So <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> let's go. All right. So just to reintroduce myself to everybody, my name is April Prayer. I am a criminal defense attorney in Chicago. I've been practicing for 22 years. So all that time I've been on my feet doing trials in courtrooms. And so I was called upon by various networks to talk about exactly what Xavier asked me about which is Mr. Kyle Rittenhouse. And we all got to watch as he was acquitted in the Wisconsin by a, by a jury of uh, all white folks or almost all white folks, I can't recall at this point. And so it has been uh, very interesting because people are like, well, how in the world that happened? He shot three people with an assault rifle. He was only 17. Why did he have an assault rifle? And how did he get a pass from taking two lives and greatly altering a third? I guess he blew off that third man's bicep completely. So Dang. his life is completely altered. So let's talk about it. So Rittenhouse, as much as people want to make it a trial about self-defense, it, it's interesting because I don't think we'll ever see a case exactly like this again. That's always the issue with the law is, you know, the facts are never exactly the same. They always alter. And so we're almost always starting from scratch with a new set of facts. But my issue in Rittenhouse was, so there were two incidents, basically. One with Mr. Rosenbaum. That was the first individual he killed. And then there was a second incident with far more individuals involved. Some were um, actually witnesses in the trial, some were not. And that's when he shot Mr. I always say it wrong, Gross Cross, Gross Cruz. Gross Croups, I think, Gross Croups and Mr. Huber, Huber, and Mr. Huber was killed. He was the one with the skateboard. So let's talk about first about Rosenbaum. Well, actually, let's talk first about self-defense. So the rule, I don't care which state in the nation you live in, and I keep getting pushback on this, and it's always funny because it's always from somebody who does not have my experience, does not have my trial experience, did not go to law school, does not have a law degree, but they want to argue me down, including all these trolls who have been climbing into my um, inbox and commenting on my page, all these Trump supporters coming from my throat since I got on TV <laughs> talking about Rittenhouse. I mean, it's been really wild, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So, but force must match force. So yes, no matter where you live in the United States, you are allowed to defend yourself from an attack, absolutely, no question. But then the question becomes, so can I pull out my Uzi and shoot you if all you did was put your dukes up? No, that is the problem. And so that's the problem with the very first individual who he shot, which was Rosenbaum. So all the Trump supporters who are coming from my throat, all these Rittenhouse sycophants want to all say that, oh, he was being attacked and he was being chased and he feared for his life and he was a poor 17 year old boy. Yeah, but the problem is force didn't match force. In fact, force was so unequal. And when I say force matches force, it means that if we're in a bar fight, you put up your fist, I put up my fist. You grab a bottle, I grab a bottle. I have a knife, you grab a knife. It's the whole don't bring a gun to a knife fight scenario. So when you up the force and change it to deadly force and all I had was my hands, then it's unequal. And that's exactly what we saw with Rosenbaum. So in that instance, Rosenbaum is chasing him. Rosenbaum is, and I don't know why they didn't focus on this more, was a slight man, very short, bald, muscular, but slight man. And he's chasing Rittenhouse. They go between two cars and Rittenhouse at that point shoots him. And so, you know, they say, oh, well, uh, uh, Rosenbaum was going to take the gun from him and he was going to shoot Kyle and he was going to shoot up a bunch of people. You can't speculate about what the person was going to do. All you can look at is what was happening in that moment. And at that moment, Rosenbaum had not even touched Kyle. And so that's significant because go back to that bar fight. Say there are two of us and we are fighting and then suddenly you up things by grabbing a bar stool and bashing me in the head. Well, guess what? Force is no longer equal. 
I can't say that, well, maybe I thought that you were going to grab a pistol out of your pants, or maybe I saw you were lunging for a knife. No, at that point, all I've done is touch you with my fist. And so in this instance, uh, Rosenbaum hadn't even yet touched Kyle with his fist. You can't speculate about what that person might have done. People want to then get into Rosenbaum's background where he was bipolar and he was off his meds and he had just gotten out the hospital and he's a sex offender. Kyle didn't know any of that at the time. And all that matters is what did you know at the time and what would a reasonable person do in your situation? Him blowing that man's chest out four times and leaving him to bleed out on the ground is not a reasonable consequence for what would have likely been a fist fight. So then we go to the second scenario where Rosen, I'm sorry, where Rittenhouse is then confronted by a skateboard, a pistol, um, and other people. It's harder to argue in that instance that he could not defend himself. Yes, he could defend himself, but an assault rifle, again, makes the territory, makes the plane very uneven. Right. So say someone had a pistol. So I, I think it was Mr. Grosscroats who had a pistol. And then you have Mr. Huber with a skateboard, which honestly I think is laughable, but he's using the skateboard as a bludgeon. So at that point, yes, Kyle could use the weapon as a bludgeon. He could use his gun as a bludgeon. He could use the barrel of the gun to hit someone with or the butt of the gun to hit someone with. But to fire in that situation, I still say force is une unequal. Um, obviously, the jury <laughs> disagree with me. But uh, that's my real problem with that. And I really do think that this is not a guns rights issue. And I think that's why so many people were coming after me. So I'll explain that. So the day after the verdict, well, the day of the verdict, throughout the trial, I went on national news. I was on News Nation, I don't know, four or five times. I was on NBC News. And it was the NBC clip that set people off because I called Kyle Rittenhouse a serial killer. And then I wrote a post on my personal page, Facebook page saying we let a, a serial killer walk. And that is where all the crazies came for me. So I did a follow-up video the next day alive just saying that because of this case, what is going to happen to defense attorneys is we're going to have lots of clients who have no viable self-defense claim, who shot someone who was unarmed, who shot someone because they got beat up with fists, and they're going to want to argue, hey, that boy in Wisconsin got off, he right. shot three people, I only shot one. And I was like, and the phone call started coming in immediately. I was talking to peers and we were already getting those phone calls the same night that Rittenhouse walked. And so that's what the video was about. It really wasn't about the case so much. So I went into my little belly dance class and <laughs> went about my day. I turned on my phone and looked at that video the next day. It had, no, that night it had 32,000 views. I said, what in the world? And then I looked a few hours later, it had 89,000 views. And then by the next day, it had 203,000 views. And it was just about all Rittenhouse supporters, all these crazies, mm -hmm. okay. calling me out of my name, telling, threatening me, telling me I don't know the law. It's all full of misspellings. They all look like they graduated from the third grade and never went any further. <laughs> and then they started sliding into my inbox. Oh, Lord. And then they got so bold as to call my law office. Oh. So, Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Calling me all kinds of B's and N's and N's and B's together. And uh, um, yeah. And then I started getting the calls on the other side, the text messages from friends saying, uh, sis, if you don't have your concealed carry, I hope you go get it. <laughs> you need me to take you to the range. I got several of those from my brothers and I appreciate them because they were all loving on me and looking out for me. But yeah, I think the Rittenhouse case is going to have a tremendous backlash and it's not going to be along color lines. You're going to have black defendants who shot somebody with no gun and say, hey, man, I only shot one person. I didn't shoot three. You're going to have Mexican defendants. You're going to have white defendants. You're going to have people around, along all racial lines pointing to this case saying this kid had an assault rifle. I didn't have an assault rifle. I had a pistol, you know, and I shot one person. And they're not going to understand that things are different when you're not a 17-year-old, fresh-faced white kid who half the country is rooting for. So right. I really don't even think it's an issue of, of gun rights. No. It's not an issue of gun rights. And that's not, and that's what people made it about. And they made it like I was anti-gun rights, which I'm not. They they made it about gun rights. They made it into a political issue. And it was political, but not in that way. 
it was political because he killed these people. I saw one meme saying he really went to shoot black people and white people got in the way. Oh, and wow. I don't know that I disagree with that. Now, yeah, you know, since and you I think it that, became. Go ahead. Since you said that, so my um my my daughter's father, um he's a retired cop, and they so Channel Twelve from Wisconsin, of course, was in Kenosha at the trial, and he he was doing security for the news team. And um, he told me that Rittenhouse attorneys were paid for by the KKK. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. So he had some of the best attorneys in the world. Plus, who knows what those connections were? So any Black, Hispanic, or other person going in there trying to stand on that trial, you're just not going to get the same result because you don't have the same stuff. No, and uh, people don't know there's there's so many polit so much politics involved in a lot of these cases that really have nothing to do with politics. So I'll give this example. This goes back a few years. I represented one of the defendants in a case called the Facebook for kidnapping case, and it happened like right after I think it was right be right around Donald Trump's inauguration. The case happened maybe a few days before, so it was a case that both Obama and Trump commented on publicly, which I don't think presidents should do, but that's neither here nor there. So they both commented on my case. I had the lead defendant, which was, who was a girl. <laughs> she was only 18, she was about 4'11 and then 100 pounds soaking wet. But it was on video of these black kids allegedly kidnapping this white boy. And that's really not how it went at all. But anyway, I say all that to say, the white boy suddenly becomes a poster child for Trumpism and Trump nation. And he didn't, he didn't sign up for that. He just happened to fall into that place because during the incident, the black kids start screaming, fuck white, I'm sorry, F white people and F, um, F Donald Trump. And so that's how it became a so-called political issue, even though they're silly kids that didn't really have that in mind. So this kid becomes a poster child. And I say all this to say, so somebody took up a GoFundMe for him, a white winged group, I would go so far as to say a neo-Nazi group, mm. you know, who put up some type of shell company, some LLC. They raised funds for him to the tune of, I want to say $200,000. I can't remember exactly. $200,000 and gave this boy a check for that just as a victim who walked away with a couple of scratches. And then it became a political issue of them dragging my client, creating fake Facebook pages for her, saying wild stuff like she hates all white people. And meanwhile, she's in Cook County Jail with no access to the internet. Oh, so they wow. stole her pictures and created profiles. And it went as far, and this is going to sound far-fetched, but I can actually back it up, that Russia actually used it as a test case when they were, you know, trying to interfere with the election, et cetera, they were trying to stir up racial tensions in the United States. So they were behind some of these profiles. And I know that because we did research and there was a, I guess, a very well-known Russian official who admitted to doing such oh my God. on my case, on my, on my little case. So I say all that to say that there are oftentimes politics that are at play, <laughs> behind the scenes on these cases to make them more racially charged than they would be um, so that, yeah, so him being bagged by the KKK or similar organizations does not surprise me. They probably set up some shell foundation and gave it some new name and then funneled their money through that to take care of Mr. Rittenhouse. Wow. Yeah, when, when he told me that, I was like, wow, well, uh, you know, we know how this is going to go, but we all kind of knew what was going to happen anyway. I was really hoping because it was not, uh, <clears throat> you know, a black guy and a, with white victims. It was actually a white guy with white victims. I was really looking to see that, you know, some justice. And, and why did no one ever talk about the mother? Well, my understanding is from the testimony I heard is that Kyle testified and his friend testified that he actually got the gun in Wisconsin. I don't know if I believe that, but oh yeah, when actually my my daughter's father told me that too. He did get the gun in Wisconsin. There was somebody there that gave him that gun once he got yeah. to Wisconsin. But the mother dropped him off there and did not come back and get him. They, from what I understand, nobody knows how he got back home. 
Yeah, well, he didn't live too far. I think he only lived like eight miles. Kenosha is not very far from where is he from? Waukegan, I want to say. Um, it's not too far. He wasn't too far across the It's border. not walking distance. I know where Kenosha is. I go to Walt Woodman's right there all the time before I hit Waukegan to come back to Chicago. It's still a drive. It's not walking distance. Yeah, well, he, I don't know. I, I think it's dangerous to implicate these parents. Uh, actually, that's funny that you say that. I just got contacted by News Nation. They want me to talk at four about this school <laughs> shooter that happened. I wasn't, I didn't follow the news. I hadn't seen it. But the school shooter from yesterday or a couple of days ago, I guess his parents just got charged with involuntary manslaughter. And I was saying, I've never seen that. I've never seen parents held responsible for the actions of their minor child, their criminal actions of a minor child. And so I just think it's a hard case to prove up when you're trying to blame a parent for, yes, the child is a minor, but when you're trying to blame the parent for the child's criminal act, I think it gets very difficult to prove up. I think most jurors would be like, nah, you're not gonna hold me responsible for my kids' actions, so I'm not gonna hold this mom responsible for hers. So I just think it gets really muddy, uh, but I'm supposed to talk about that at four on the news. It just, I don't oh. know, because she dropped him off over there, it just seems like she would have some responsibility, but maybe she didn't know what he was going to do. I guess that's what she would say anyway. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the same can be said for uh, just about any killer who's 16 or 17 year old. They live with somebody. And so did mom turn a blind eye to the gun under his pillow or his mattress or in the closet or in his book bag? I'm not talking about Kyle. I'm just talking about, you know, we have a bunch of killers who are 16, 17, 18. So should their parents be responsible for being kind of lax and not searching their rooms. I, I don't know. I just think that's a, a very dangerous, slippery slope. I don't think it deters, is going to ultimately deter criminal behavior in delinquent minors. I just don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to have the type of impact that people are hoping. Okay. But <laughs> enough of this Rittenhouse mess, because like I said, I literally have thousands of people um, coming after me about me saying one phrase on NBC News. It's kind of ridiculous. But it's, I think it's just dangerous that we live in a time where you can't have an opinion. And if your opinion differs from my opinion, now not only can I challenge you on it, I can come after you and accost you. I can come after you physically. And I just think that's really a really, really sad fact that people's lives are in harm's way because they have a differing opinion and you know and like I said oh, my yeah. opinion is backed up by 22 years of experience so you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me but I'm gonna tear you down in the courtroom but most of these people can't handle it in the courtroom because they write on a fifth grade level right. but anyway <laughs> <laughs> I feel you girl <laughs> So the other major trial that happened right after Rittenhouse was also racially charged, and that was the McMichaels Bryan case. And most people don't even know those names because they know the victim's name, Ahmad Arbery. Yes. And that to me, I thought that that was a very clear case of a modern day lynching. And that case gave me chills. It reminded me so much of the facts of the Emmett Till case that you suspect me of something that you don't personally witness and you round me up like a dog in the street and kill me. Yeah. And that was just so heartbreaking to me. You know, and at the time, I believe the initial narrative that um, Arbery was a runner and I'm a runner. And so I remember when the video first came out and I was just like, I can't imagine being accosted on my run by some people who are demanding that I talk to them. And then if I don't talk to them, you start chasing me. I was like, I just can't imagine how frightening that was for him. And then we learned as the trial went on that maybe he was a runner, maybe he wasn't. It sounds like he, he was <laughs> visiting that property many times. And I talked to a good friend of mine who does a lot of... Um, purchases a lot of properties and he told me he says you know April literally I cried when I heard about that case and I said this is a grown man in his 60s and he's I said why did you cry he said do you know how many properties my wife and I have stood in dreaming mm -hmm. do you know how many times we've gone to different developments multiple times to see what their progress was and he was like you know to think that we could have been killed 
for simply like imagining what our life would look like in five years or 10 years or whatever, if we buy this property or we buy a similar property or do we wanna do our kitchen like they're doing their kitchen or how's the electrical work coming in in this house and where's the plumbing going to be? He said, just to think that we could have been killed for that, he said, was heartbreaking to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that was my first thought. I said, maybe this boy was, you know, and I say boy, cause I'm in my forties and he was 25. Maybe this boy was in this house just dreaming, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I heard that he was going to school for electrical, I don't know what the, for the electrical trade. And so I said, to me, that made sense. Okay, you're in the electrical trade or you're anticipating going in. You want to see how, okay, where, how do they wire this house? How does it start? How do they put the drywall up? When do you do the, when do you do the electrical work? I don't know why Ahmad was there, nor do I care because at best he was committing criminal trespass, which in all states is a misdemeanor. And so to see this trial, and I and I always, if I don't miss, and if I want, if I miss most of the trial, I always want to see the defendant testify. Now, a defendant has a constitutional right to testify or not to testify, but in general, juries want to hear from defendants. They want to hear your side of the story. They don't want you to sit there in silence. They want, and, and most defendants don't testify. But in a case like this, I knew that the McMichaels really had no choice. I see that his dad did not testify and Brian did not testify. And Travis testified terribly mm. because he's probably one of those on the fifth grade reading level. He's not very bright. They tried to give him a whole bunch of big legal phrases to talk about, and he botched all of those. So when I heard how horribly he testified, I really did believe it would be a guilty for him, but I thought they would cut the dad and the neighbor loose. So I was actually pleasantly surprised when everybody was found guilty. Yes, I was happy to. But that's the right result because in... So that it's interesting because it's another legal doc doctrine that most people don't know about, and it's called the felony murder rule. And this is what they were actually charged with. Not only were they charged with what in Georgia is called malice murder, which everywhere else would be intentional murder or first degree murder, um, malice murder, but they were also charged with the felony murder counts. And so what felony murder is, is if you are in the commission of another felony, and each state has a different list of what those felonies are. Usually it's something like robbery, burglary, something like that. If you are committing a crime like that and someone dies during your commission of that crime, even if they die accidentally, everybody involved will be charged with murder. So the most common example we see is a bunch of teenagers break into a house, thinking the house is empty. Surprise, they get inside. The homeowner is not only there, but the homeowner is armed. They flee. The homeowner shoots one of them as they're fleeing. And guess what? Now the teenagers are charged with their dead friend's murder. Oh. And people are always like, well, wait a minute. How'd that happen? The teens weren't even, they weren't even armed. They didn't know that guy was there. Nope. But by breaking into that person's house, you knew that there was a reasonable chance that someone was at home and that, and, and that it was an innately dangerous crime and it committing. So if somebody dies, everybody gets charged for murder. And so you see it with bank robberies, you see it with you know, robberies of T-Mobile stores, the list goes on and on. And this was an example of that. The McMichaels were involved in false imprisonment. They were involved in aggravated assault. They were involved in aggravated battery. All these charges against missed all these crimes that they were committing against Mr. Arbery for, you know, in their eyes being basically suspicious and black and in their neighborhood. And as a result, even if he had died accidentally, they would have been all charged with his murder. And so it was uh, interesting to see that the jury understood the principle, that it was explained well in that case, and that he would, that they were all found guilty of this murder, even though Travis was the only one who pulled the trigger. Okay. <clears throat> we just learned something. Um, so if you are a young person out there listening and you and your buddies are in, up to no good, if one of your buddies gets hurt while you're up to no good, you're going to be charged for his murder. Did you hear that yeah. one? Yeah. 
It's yeah. really hard to explain because, you know, so I, I, I'll go ahead and um, tell people where they can follow me. You can follow me on Facebook or on Instagram. It's all the same handle. It's Justice Junkie and that's J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E. And I spell it differently because there's a saying that there is no justice, there's just us, meaning that Black and Brown people are uh, have been traditionally excluded from justice. We have been um, you know, alienated, we have been targeted by law enforcement, et cetera, and I wanted to change that paradigm. So in along those lines, I developed a board game to teach teens all these different principles that I'm talking about, like the felony murder rule and accountability, because I find that it's very hard for teens to understand. Um, another principle that came up with the McMichael's trial was party to a crime. So party to a crime, that's what they call it in Georgia. In most our states, they call it group accountability. Meaning if there are a group of us and we play a small role in a crime that we all get charged with the more serious crime. And so that was also at play. So take the murder out of it. Say they had just held Mr. Arbery and all Mr. Bryan did was block him in with his truck. Never touched him, never got out the car, never pulled a gun on him. He would still be responsible for all of the actions committed by the two McMichaels because he was a party to a crime. It doesn't matter if you help in the planning, doesn't matter if you help in the execution, doesn't help matter if you help in the cleanup, the hiding of the crime, you are a party to that crime in Georgia. And like I said, in other states, it's called accountability. And so this is a major theme in my game because so often I have kids who play a small role. Like they're walking down the street, they see some kid from school they don't like, they decided to be funny to beat him up. As they're beating him up, his iPhone falls out of his pocket. One of the guys grabs the iPhone, somebody else grabs a stick. They hit him a couple of times, they run off. And they're thinking, okay, at best, if I get caught, I'm going to get charged with theft because I took the iPhone. No, you're going to get charged with it. You're going to get charged with armed robbery because all of your actions together, the use of the stick, the beating them up, the taking of an item, that all adds up to you stole something using force. That's an armed robbery. But kids don't get that. So insert a gun instead of a stick and you didn't know your friend had the gun, guess what? You're still going down for the larger crime, even though you played a very minor role. Kids do not get it. So imagine how easy it is to get caught up with a group in a spur of the moment crime. You didn't plan it out like Ocean's Eleven. You don't have maps. You're not scurrying down from the ceiling in your black garb with your scope on your forehead. You didn't plan any of this. And now all of a sudden you're in it and you play a very small role, but you don't run away. You don't call the police. You don't extricate yourself from that situation. You don't help the victim. Guess what? You're going down for the major crime, not the minor crime. Kids do not get it. But when they play my game, then they see themselves in the situation because there are real life scenarios in the game, 54 real life scenarios. The game is called Trials and Triumph. When they see it in the game, they have this aha moment like, oh, man, I could have gotten caught up last week. I got to get caught up messing with these friends that I need to distance myself from. And then they understand what the repercussions are. Okay. You, you know, everybody needs to get your game. I, I've been thinking about getting your game for my granddaughter because um, she's 20 and, you know, they're in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee right now is just as crazy as Chicago, but Milwaukee is smaller. So getting caught up in something is big. There's a good possibility you could get caught, get caught up in something. Um, so, yeah. And I see that you have a Christmas special going, too. Oh, no, no. I did. Last week, I had a bunch of holiday specials. I'll run some more closer to Christmas, but I had a bunch uh, post-Thanksgiving and pre-Thanksgiving. So I'll roll out some more specials coming up in the next few weeks. Okay. So... So, you know, it's just, I love going in and playing it with kids because then they have, they have context. They have questions with teeth. They're not talking in a vacuum of what do I do if a cop stops me? They like, no, nah, this card in my hand, I don't understand. Why did I go to jail? And then we can have a conversation about it. So it's just really powerful to watch kids play, to forget that adults are in the room and to start having their own conversations and just kind of doing their own critical thinking and working things out for themselves and realizing they need to make different choices just based on playing this game for 25 minutes. 
Heck, some of these adults need to play that game and make better choices. Yeah, because that's the thing. There's always an adult in the room, usually as a proctor, and they'll pull me to the side and be like, girl, I didn't know I ain't have to take them DUI tests. It's always elderly people. <laughs> I ain't know I need to, I ain't take them DUI tests. I need to meet you 30 years ago. I'm like, <laughs> when had that dang DUI? I'm like, yeah, ma'am, you don't have to take the test. The cops are never going to tell you that. You just have to know and then opt out. But the uh, case of the week is Smollett. Okay. So I definitely want to dive into the Smollett trial. And I must say, I was quite strategic in that I placed myself in the courtroom for the Smollett trial. So Jesse Smollett, for those of who you do not know, was a star on a very popular TV show that I've never seen in my life called Empire. And uh, never even heard of Jesse before this happened. I loved <laughs> that show. I binge watched the whole thing. Really? I've never seen one episode. All the seasons. <laughs> is a, I love that show. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I've never seen it and I had never heard of him. I knew his sister from Eve's Bayou and then later from Lovecraft Country. And I liked her a lot. I, I didn't know this. I didn't know this guy at all. Who's his sister? And so, Journey, Journey Smollett. Hmm. Girl, you know if you see her, she's been on a lot of stuff. Okay. So anyway, so he gets in trouble th almost going on three years ago for initially they believed he had been the victim of a hate crime. He is openly gay and he is black. And they thought that he had been the victim of a hate crime. And then some time passed in the city of Chicago. The Chicago Police Department uh, deduced that the hate crime had actually been faked and orchestrated by Mr. Smollett. They then charged him with, in Illinois, what falls under the disorderly conduct statute, and which is called filing a false police report. So he was charged, and he was charged with the felony version of this which carries one to three years in prison oh. and probation is available. He was charged with, I believe, 15 or 16 counts Whoa. the first time around. And then the case quietly got dismissed. And then there was a huge backlash on the state's attorney here because apparently she had some emails between somebody from Smollett's tribe. I don't know if it was from his family. Or I, I don't know. I, I don't remember all the details. But then she recused herself from the case. Um, initially, he was given a big fine, given some community service, and it was all done quietly. And then the case was, I believe, uh, it was either sealed. I think it was immediately sealed. So defense attorneys, so this is my county. This is literally the courthouse. I is my second home, this particular courthouse. I know the first judge he appeared in front of. I know the judge is in front of now. Out of his seven, seven attorneys, I know three of them. <laughs> so, like, I'm familiar with four. I know three of them, have known them for years. So, like, this is my second home. So, I say I placed myself strategically in the courtroom because there was a decision made to have no cameras in the courtroom. And so, I made it my goal to go every day. Okay. And I have been there every day for the last four days. I could not make it today because of the show. And then I found out. The judge gave him today off, so that worked out. Oh, perfectly. cool! That's perfect. Because I'm like, oh man, we're gonna want to know. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. So people had pretty much public opinion was that Jesse was guilty as hell, right? That was public opinion. There were memes all over Facebook and Instagram calling him Juicy Smiley, <laughs> and uh, you know, and with the sad face or with the Jordan face crying and just saying that you know that he had made this stuff up. And it was racially charged because he said that the person or the persons who attacked him put a noose around his neck. And obviously there's a historical um, basis for that, you know, amongst African-Americans. Right. And also that he was yet that when they when they stopped him, they yelled out a gay slur and they yelled out a um, African-American slur, which we all know what that is. Mm -hmm. And that the person was wearing, one of the persons was wearing a red hat and yelled out, this is MAGA country. MAGA stands for Make America Great Again. Obviously a nod to uh, Donald Trump, the devil. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, don't bite my tongue. So anyway, so after that, so when they found out that this was allegedly a hoax, there was this, you know, this whole brouhaha. So anyway, I, 
you know, I went into court too, pretty much assuming the boy was guilty too, but I did not follow the media after the dismissal. So first I'll talk about the dismissal. The dismissal, the ultimate end result of him getting community service for a case like this is not unusual. I have actually had cases very similar, as strange as that sounds, where there's a cross-racial um, identification or implication that someone of a different race attacked you, that this crime was committed against you, this robbery or beat up or battery or what have you. And then after police review all the cameras that they find out that nothing of the sort happened, but the person digs their heels in and says this happened to them. So believing, say you believe the prosecution's case, I've had a case almost identical to this. And that resulted in the person being charged with a felony, I think just one count, not 16, like Jesse, that being reduced to a misdemeanor. So the difference in Illinois is a misdemeanor can carry up to one year in jail. You're very unlikely to get any time in jail on almost any misdemeanor unless you have a background. And it carries up to $2,500 fee, fine. And then whereas a felony is one year in jail up to life in jail. Uh, so that's a, a huge difference. So he's charged with a felony right now, carries one to three years in jail, whereas a misdemeanor, he would be looking at probably community service. So for the case to result initially in community service was not unusual, right? What was unusual was the way it was done quietly, that he had to pay some, I can't remember what it was. I should have looked it up. He had to pay some fine. He had to turn over his bond to the victim's fund or something, something kind of weird. And the fact that it was sealed immediately so that the media couldn't see what happened to the case. All of that was strange. Um, and so what happened was then a special prosecutor picked it up and basically recharged him a year later with what had already been dismissed. And I think it's six counts now. So I've been in the courtroom for the last four days. Watch, I've seen everything from openings up until yesterday when the key witness was examined uh, direct and then cross-examination. And then I saw the direct of the older brother. And then I was barred from the courtroom oh. for the cross of the older brother. And I want to talk about this first. It is very important in the United States that trials are public forums. It's crucial that trials are public forums. And the reason it's crucial is to make sure that everything that happens in the courtroom is above board and mm -hmm. that if it isn't above board that you have witnesses. So it is very problematic that the public will be barred from any portion of a very publicized media trial or a very minor trial with a so-called nobody. It's very important because that's the only way, because there are really no checks and balances for judges. Judges are little tyrants. They really are. They're really little tyrants of their own little fiefdom. And that's how they treat the people in that court. Not all judges, of course, just the outrageous ones. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an outrageous judge and you don't have any eyeballs on that person, what happens? They get more and more drunk on their power and more and more outrageous. Yep. And so in this case, because of freaking COVID, there's some arbitrary number that the public, I guess the Department of Public Health came up with that this huge majestic courtroom can only hold 57 people, right? So that sounds like a lot, except for there are 14 people on the jury, 12 jurors plus two alternates. There are 10 people in Jesse's family, there are seven people on Jesse's defense team. There are seven people on the other team, on the prosecution team. You have the judge, the court reporter, the clerk, and two sheriffs. That's all mandatory. And then they slotted 21 slots for, for the media. So that leaves no space for the public. So the first day that I went when they were doing picking the jury and they were about to do openings, First, they let me in the courtroom with one other person from the public. We were the only two people allowed from the public. Now, think about how ridiculous that is. There's no overflow room. There are no cameras. So two of us, and the other man is a Burge torture survivor. I'll probably have him on here one day. Burge torture survivor. Burge was a dirty detective who set up several Black men and Black teens for murder charges that they didn't commit, like, in the Oh, 80s. wow. That would so be a he, great show. 
Yeah, so he's a birds torture survivor, and he's and he's super vocal and super like he in it. Everybody's afraid of him. Judges are afraid of him. Politicians are afraid of him because he's loud and he's gonna make his voice heard and he's gonna fight for what's right. So it's me and Mark Clements hanging out. We get into the courtroom. We're in the courtroom about ten minutes before they kick us out. COVID restrictions. Then oh. they open the side door and say y'all can. And they cut, kick out several of the media. About twelve of the media. We are all in a huddle at the side door. I'm not kidding, like a football huddle. At the side door, trying to lean in, I'm leaning over the courtroom illustrator, trying to see and hear. Most people could, I could actually see and hear, most people could only hear. That's how bad it was. That's day one. Day two, we go back and suddenly the numbers have changed and they've allowed in at least 65 people. Mark and I sit comfortably and watch the trial. Day three is fine. Yesterday, it's cool. I go to lunch. I come back. They have changed the numbers over lunch. So in the morning, I can get in. And in the afternoon, Mark, another attorney, and some other folks, we were all stuck in the hallway. So, But it's, it's problematic because yesterday, a lot of dramatic things happened, including the female, Black female defense attorney said the judge lunged at her. So if the judge lunged at her, and I know her well, and if the judge lunged at her, wouldn't it be important for her to have witnesses in the room to say whether it happened or not? Wouldn't it be important for the the judge to have witnesses in the room to say whether it happened or not other than courtroom staff other than the prosecution or defense but that luxury was taken away because they kicked the public out so I say all that to say it's a really big deal that the public is being barred from this smallette trial based on COVID or not based on COVID they needed to have an overflow room but aside from that most people assumed that Jesse was guilty of sin. And I'll be honest, I went to go support the defense, but, you know, and to place myself there strategically in case the media wanted to call upon me for my views. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I'm sitting there and I'm just assuming the boy is guilty as hell. Like, okay, well, let's, let's see what they're talking about. But what was interesting was as the defense was allowed to cross-examine the two key witnesses in this case, um, and it's two Nigerian brothers. They go by Bola and Ola. Oh, Their Lord. last name, I think I finally got it. Let me see if I get it right. It's Oshun, wait, 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 wait. Oshun Dio. Oshun Dio. Yeah, Oshun Dio. Everybody in the trial has said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they have. Everybody on both sides, <laughs> except for the defense attorney who is also Nigerian. He nailed it. But everybody else has messed it up. It's Oshun Dio. So the Oshun Dio brothers, Bola and Ola, Bola is the youngest. Bola was friends with Jesse. He befriended him. When he befriended him, Jesse was already a star. Bola worked on Empire. They did not know each other from Empire. They were introduced through a third party. But Bola immediately recognized if I befriend this boy, I might be able to advance my career because Bola and Ola are just extras. And okay. they both love theater. They both study theater. Bola had a degree in theater, but could not get past being an extra or a stand in on various shows in Chicago. And but all of a sudden his luck changed when he met Jesse. So he went from went from extra to being Jesse's regular like hangout buddy. They would smoke weed together. They would go to the strip clubs together. They would go to the club together. And then what came out was not only did Bola hang out with Jesse, but he was also Jesse's drug dealer. Oh. He bought him, yeah, he bought, he would sell him cocaine. He sold him Molly's and he sold him marijuana. And so in addition to going to strip clubs, and it was never specified whether they were male or female strip clubs. I was going to ask is, you that too. <laughs> they never said, but Bola is supposedly heterosexual and Jesse, like I said, is openly homosexual. It came out though that Bola and Jesse went to a gay male bathhouse in Boys Town that while they were at the bathhouse in Boys Town, um, that... The defense at least asked Bola, and he fended, you know, argued and said no, that they both masturbated together oh. at the bathhouse, right? So the implication is that there's some type of sexual relationship there, or at least Bola was leading Jesse to believe that there was a sexual relationship there, because it seems like Jesse had a crush on Bola. Oh. So, yeah. 
So, and Bola is basically milking this for all it's worth because he said this man could advance my career. So then he just goes ahead and asks Jesse, hey, can you get me a you know better gig on Empire? Jesse makes a call and gets Bola a, a role as a stand-in, which I guess is an upgrade from being a being an extra, a, a extra, a extra. <laughs> and so Ola doesn't really know Jesse. That's just, you know, he's he's Bola's older brother, but Ola is outwardly and overtly homophobic he has a string of uh um homophobic text messages he has a string of homophobic uh, messages on social media he is outwardly openly homophobic and so i'm sure he was not thrilled that his younger brother's new best friend was a gay dude from empire um but he also saw it as a way to possibly advance his career so the two brothers lived in a house together, which the defense is trying to set up was a trap house. They had guns, they had assault rifles, a 2012 uh, gay shotgun, ammo wow. for other guns that were not found. They had a suspect heroin, which actually turned out to be cocaine in a safe with a nine millimeter. That's fine. Bola is a legal gun owner, but Ola is a convicted felon. And in Illinois, a convicted felon cannot live in a house with weapons. Right. And so the defense's argument is that Ola and Bola made up this story about Jesse orchestrating this in order to avoid Ola going to prison for a gun conviction. Because the two brothers, um, you know, they were seen on scene. They were tracked down by different video surveillance as the ones who orchestrated this attack. And they were arrested. They went to Nigeria the next day, were there for two weeks. A minute, the minute they came back to O'Hare, they were arrested. And upon being arrested, they were in custody for almost 48 hours. They finally asked for a lawyer. After speaking to the lawyer, suddenly they had this story saying that Jesse orchestrated it. And at that point, they were probably going to be arrested for these, for at least Ola, for these uh, possession of these weapons and the cocaine and the ammunition, which a felon can't have any of that, obviously. And so that's that's a big part of the argument. But really, the aha moment or the bombshells for me were immediately upon release, these brothers were put up in a hotel by Chicago police. Right. Now, why is that significant? Yeah. Why is that significant? That's significant because I've represented a number of people who were eyewitnesses to murders who were terrified for their lives, terrified that the murderers or their, you know, friends will come and kill them. And the police were like, yeah, oh, well, keep your head down. Maybe go to your mama's house or go oh. someplace. They don't know your address that I've never heard. And I've been doing this 22 years in Chicago. I have never heard once of Chicago police ever putting any witness up in any type of hotel ever but that wasn't the clincher the clincher was later bola then tried to shake jesse down for 2.9 million dollars oh my god to go away to go away he said if you give me 2.9 i'll go away I, I presumably to nigeria i'll go away and won't testify and the police won't be able to find me if you give me 1 million then I'll tell the truth. The reason that's significant is when the defense attorney confronted Bola about this, there were no objections from the prosecution. What that means is that there's that that is true. Because if it had not been true, or if it had been speculation, or if it had been some rumor, the, the prosecution would have been on their feet, jumping up and down. Oh my God, judge, blah, 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 this is not allowed. But there were crickets on their side. So this let me know that in advance, the judge ruled that this information was coming in. And two, that the information is true. So he tried to extort almost $3 million out of Jesse to go away. So with that and the fact that the, they were put up by Chicago police, lets me know, one, there are political issues here that Jesse's probably caught in the crosshairs of that. And two, the case is not as simple and cut, as, cut and dry and as much of a slam dunk for the prosecution as everybody might have believed initially. So on Monday, my guess is the case will wrap and Jesse has to testify. So like I've said a few times, any defendant has a constitutional right to testify or not to testify. Nobody can force you to testify. But in a case like this, the jury wants to hear from you. In a case where it's basically he say, he say, is your word against mine? Everybody wants to hear what Jesse's story is. 
and they want to hear it in a court of law, not on Good Morning America, not on some talk show. They want to hear how he's going to, you know, sadly, quote unquote, defend himself against these charges. He has no obligation to do it. But in a case like this, he has to hit the stand to tell his story. And I'm going to do my darndest to be in the courtroom, because when you're not in the courtroom, you miss out on things like the judge rolling his eyes and throwing <clears throat> <clears throat> a tantrum on the stand. You miss the sheriffs confronting somebody and walking them out of the room. You miss the attorneys about to throw papers at each other because they're so mad and they're yelling at the top of their lungs. You miss all of these. These get lost in tweets. These get lost in newspaper articles. You have to be you know, seeing it live and in living color. And I'm just very fortunate that I've been able to do that for the last week. Man, and now we don't get to talk to you again until next month. Oh my <laughs> God. This is like yeah. a freaking show. And I'm like sitting here on the edge of my seat listening like, oh my God, what do you mean? Okay, you got to come back Monday. Then. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have a verdict by then. So this will be a month out. But yeah, it's just really fascinating. It's interesting, you know, because I know all the players. Like I said, I know this judge. I've done multiple cases in front of this judge. I know the clerk in the courtroom. I know the sheriff in the courtroom. Everybody, like, hey, April, people running up and hugging me. I know three of the seven defense attorneys, you know. So it's just, it's like literally being in my home, but I get to watch instead of being the one on my feet. And I, and I learn every time I do this, I learn something new. I learn how to get exhibits in. I learn what's effective and what's not. I get to talk to other court watchers to see what annoys them or what resonates with them. So it's been a really great experience for all those reasons. And you know, and I clearly have a defense slant. I am definitely rooting for Jesse and his, just because I know his team. But, uh, you know, and it's just great to see, you know, really, honestly, it's great to see Black attorneys being given this chance to shine. So whether they win or lose, they all get their name in the paper. Their, new, their names will all be in national news. People will want to do interviews with them. And that is such a blessing because we don't get that shot. We don't get the kind of pay that white attorneys do when there are celebrity cases. Very rarely do celebrities come looking for us. Mm -hmm. They come looking for folks that don't look like us. And so it's really a great opportunity to see all these Black attorneys get the opportunity to shine. Um, and I'm glad that Jesse, yeah, I'm glad that Jesse made the decision. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have a question real quick. So, uh -huh. okay, I don't know if I missed something toward the beginning of the story. So I know that the case was closed, right? Yeah, it was dismissed. It's dismissed. That's what I thought you said. I just didn't want to use that word because I'm like, I'm just going to say closed. Because So now I missed, how did they get it back open again? They re-indicted him. They indicted him on you know, you can slightly only be different, once. different charges. Yeah, no, you can. If they do it within a certain time frame, you can be indicted. Um, so they indicted him. They were well within the statute of limitations. They indicted him. But that is why the activist I mentioned, that's why he's there. Because he says, I think this is going to have implications on people who plead guilty or who get some sort of deal and their case is dismissed, it's kind of like you take it away and then you bring it back. Like that takes away some confidence that people have in the system. Well, how do you punish me twice for one action, which is essentially what happened. My greater concern is it opened Jesse up to make statements in between the two cases. So what if he thought he was in the clear, case was dismissed, and then he went on the news and was like, yeah, man, I did this stuff. You know, I, it was silly, it was foolish of me. Now you've got statements in between oh. the two cases that you can use against him in the second case. Now that didn't happen, but you can't, like, like you said, it's like you can't be, and I, I won't use that phrase, but you can't give something to somebody and then take it back. You can't give something to somebody, take it back, and then punish them for it. And, and so I agree that there are, there could be a ripple effect. It does create even more distrust in a already, um, a system that's already distrust. Wow. That is uh, amazing. Um, that I've learned some new stuff today. I always learn something new with you because um, I look at <laughs> all the stories and in between everything, there is always definitely a lesson. I love your show. You know, I did your replays last week and uh, around Thanksgiving and you were another one that had a, a lot of listeners when your replays came on. I, I don't know if people were waiting to hear you or if just your energy and passion for what you do, but you have one of the popular shows on the station as well. So congrats for that too. And um, Thank you. 
Okay, tell everybody, because we're about to wrap it up, uh, tell everybody how they can get in touch with you and when are you going to be on NBC and all of those news stations that you're on? Well, I'm being on News Nation today, so they want to interview me at four. I don't know if it'll be recorded, but we usually do live. So I'll be on News Nation today. I will be in the Chicago Sun-Times. We did an interview right before I hopped on here. So I'll be in the Sun-Times for the second time this week. Um, I think that'll be today or tomorrow. But the way to, to check me out is to follow me at Justice Junkie, J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm far more present on Facebook than on Instagram. And then to get the game at J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E dot store. I mean, I really think every household in America should have it, especially every Black and Latinx uh, household in America needs to have this. We need to protect our kids. The reason we get caught up is in the system is because we don't know the law and we think that we do. The talk does not work. Whatever parents are telling, it's hard for parents to teach something if they don't know it themselves. Right. And that's all the talk is, is us uh, recapping old wives tales and rumors and myths. So I'm just, you know, I love teaching like this, like whether it's radio, TV, I see it as an opportunity to break down the law and stop having the having legalese be a barrier from us in the bench because we don't know what's going on. Words are flashing past us really quickly and we end up being in the dark. And I just love breaking it down so that people understand what the law means and what's happening to them if they're in the legal system. Okay. Okay, Miss. Uh, there I go again. Attorney. <laughs> okay, attorney. Attorney April Prayer. You are so wonderful. You're just amazing to me. I'm just so in awe of you all the time. And so proud. Thank you, of Xavier. You. That's I'm sweet. so proud of you that you're out there representing us. I'm behind you 100%. And if they don't stay out of your DM, they're going to have to deal with me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get them. I got your back. <laughs> all right. Okay, then. Uh, today is December 3rd. And if you are listening to a replay of this show, be sure and catch the live shows on Mondays from 7 to 9 a.m. And on Thursdays and Fridays from 12 to 2. Now, I want to know who do you know in Chicago that always knows what events are going on? Did a name come to mind? If so, please connect me to them because we need someone to go to handle the What's Hot segment for Chicago. We need to know the upcoming events, a little celebrity gossip, and a little bit of. Netflix and chill, what, what movies do you suggest for the next Netflix and chill segments? We need someone from, from Chicago for that. I seem to be a little tongue-tied right now. Hopefully I'll get that together in just a second. <clears throat> now, if you are a promoter in Chicago and would like to zoom in on Thursdays to promote your upcoming events or shows, please visit my Facebook page, Xavier Fox, to get Zoom information. My monthly podcast is scheduled for Sunday. I'm so excited. Sunday, December 5th from 3 to 4, we're going to discuss the evolution of relationships. Men and women, some of them that you know, I have some of your favorite Facebook personalities on the show. You'll be able to see them live. They will share their viewpoint on how dating, relationships, and the view of marriage has changed. Um, you could go to my Facebook page and see the promotions for that. The show will air live on my Facebook page and on my YouTube channel, Xavier Fox Media. Please visit my YouTube channel, Xavier Fox Media, and click subscribe. That way you won't miss any of the upcoming podcasts and you can watch my talk shows and the podcasts you've not seen yet. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn as Xavier Fox. That's X-A-V as in Victor, I A. F-O-X, Xavier Fox. My book, The Men in My Life and What I've Learned, is available on Amazon in Kindle format and paperback. You can also purchase an autographed copy on my website, XavierFox.com. Be sure and visit my website for information on all upcoming shows and events, as well as merchandise such as t-shirts and coffee mugs. So I am signing out until Monday morning talk from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. We'll come back strong with, oh, no pun intended, because Samir Ali will be with us and he's going to help the fellas that are dealing with erectile dysfunction. Yes, he is. He's going to help them 
Get It Together the Holistic Way. And then we'll interview Ms. Tamika Thompson of Sassy Thrifters. So I will talk to y'all on Monday. Until then, stay safe and be prosperous. And I'm out.